Hello and welcome to the RTE Soccer Podcast. I'm Anthony Pine and I'm very happy to be joined this week by Gary Rogers and Conan Byrne. We'll be having a chat about the weekend's FAI Cup games. No huge shocks, but plenty of drama. Uh, we're going to take a stab at predicting how Shamrock Rovers will get on in their Europa Conference League group. And we'll be looking ahead to Thursday night's huge World Cup qualifier between the Republic of Ireland and Finland at Tallaght Stadium. But first, Gary, no major upsets in the second round of the FA Cup, but uh, Wexford came pretty close. They pushed on Dock all the way at Ferry Carrick Park. Uh, they lost 3 2 in extra time, but Stephen O'Donnell will probably be a relieved man to still be in the competition after that. It was It was a tough night at the office, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know they'll be very relieved to come out of there and still be in the in the competition because to be fair to Wexford, like they played really well and I was very impressed with how how they attacked the game and they attacked with purpose and speed. Um, obviously, look, they took they took a lead and, and you know Dundalk obviously got back into the game, pegged them back a little bit. But Nathan Shepherd was excellent in the game. He had a number of saves, one right before half time uh, and one right after the break. And uh, like Wexford, you know. They consider themselves unlucky to be out of the cup because uh, look, it, it took an injury time penalty from Robbie Benson and a bit of magic from Ryan O'Kane um, to drag them off back into that game. Um, but look, I suppose that's probably the little bit of experience and know-how kind of coming through with them off that they were able to probably not be at their best but still get a result. And, and I think you know you, you'll find that I suppose seasoned teams and the cup good cup teams like them off will be able to do that. But I'm sure Stevie O'Donnell is a relieved man, but you have to be very impressed with how Wexford are doing their business and Ian Ryan in particular because, you know, they they, they really look very good and, and you know, like, I was really impressed with how they attacked and the speed in which they attacked. So that he's obviously a very good coach uh, and had a game plan in place for Dundalk and his players carried it out really well, but just wasn't enough on the day. Yeah, Adrian Eames spoke to people within Wexford about the work that's going on behind the scenes. That was a segment that went out on um, Saturday Sports on Radio 1 at the weekend. You can listen back to that if anyone's interested. It's on the RT Sport website. You'll find it on the Soccer Index. But there's a lot, there's a lot of positive work going on behind the scenes there. And by all accounts, as you say, Gary, they, they, they gave a very good account of themselves and were, were unlucky on the night. Yeah, absolutely. Look, like I think it's probably important that they... Nathan Shepard probably had more to do uh, in the goals than than uh, the Wexford keeper in, by far, and like not just like uh, average running the mill stuff, like he two or three really really good saves, and um, so like that's great credit to, to Wexford that they're creating that amount of opportunities against a, a Premier Division outfit. So yeah, look, I think you know all in all there'll be you know the Dave McMillan got his fifteenth FPI Cup goal, and uh, Ryan O'Kane got a really good goal. And, and Robbie Benson put away the penalty, but I think Wexford come out of the game with massive credit. And again, they probably don't want that. They want to come out of the game with a result. But I think, you know, the, the, the style of football and the way they're doing their business then, they're definitely catching the eye. Yeah, uh, elsewhere then, Conan, uh, Bohemians got past Luke and United of the Leinster Senior League 2-0. Um, we'll ask Gary a little bit about this match as well. He's at the Eddie Park. But just, just specifically for you, Conan, Jonathan Afalabi got his first goal for Bowles in that match. Um what, what what did you make of that move? I mean, he was he was such a promising underage player at international level. He went to Celtic. It hasn't moved out for him, but uh, this I guess is a chance for him to hit the reset button on his career. Yeah, and I think we. I don't think we should be we shouldn't be putting too much pressure on these players. Um, he's still only twenty two years old. He's never played a top flight game before. He's played Scottish Championship and Scottish League One, all right. Um, and he's scored pretty. A lot of goals in, in those leagues. He's, I think he's got eight goals in, in 18 starts. But, yeah, it's a good move for him. I think he needed to do it. I think he needed to resurrect his career, play, play in the League of Ireland. But, like, as Gary will, will, will say as well, it's a very, very tough league to play in. Um, and we've seen a lot of players coming back from England that, that it hasn't worked out for. And I just hope that Afalabi now comes in it's a number of games under his belt. He still hasn't started a game. Well, he hasn't started any league games this season. He obviously started the other night and that's going to give him the, the world of confidence going forward. Very well taken goal. We all know his, his form at, at underage international level. Um, but when he was fantastic in uh, in the under 19 championship a couple of years ago. So um, he just needs to, to get back to, to, to that level and hopefully he can do that at Bose because he's, he's with Trevor Crowley as coach and Keith Long as manager. Um, they have a they have a good little um, way of getting the best out of their players. Mm. Just on the game itself, then Gary was that comfortable enough for Bowles? Yeah, like I think it was it was comfortable enough at two 0 They probably 
could have scored a couple more goals. Liam Burt opened the scoring with a really well taken goal. He was involved in the second goal as well. Like it was a superb header, header by Apalabi. And um, you just think that, you know, that it was a quite a strong Bohemian team. I would have expected them to to be a little bit more comfortable in the game. But look, they got the job done. They're into the next round. Um, they, they obviously play Pat tonight, which would be a really big game, and Shamrock Rovers on Friday. So I think Keith wasn't taking any chances with his team selection because obviously, you know, European football is an outside bet in terms of the league, but getting it through the Cup, um, it, it seems to be the best opportunity for Bohemians. It was good for Apple Abbey to, to get a, a start and obviously to get a goal. Um, I think, you know, you, you, he is going to have to really play well between now and the end of the season. The likes of the top players there at Bowes are, are going to have to kind of light it up and, and do really well in the cup competition in particular um, to probably get European football. But um, yeah, look, it, it was comfortable, could have been more comfortable. The Luton keeper made a couple of cracking saves in the second half, um, like two or three really, really good saves. Um, but um, look, Bowes never really looked like they were going to go out. Yeah, just a couple other games involving the non-league clubs. And Minute beaten three 0 by Treaty United. Uh, Malahide United were beaten six 0 by Waterford. And Bonnie United were beaten four 0 by Shelburne. That was up in Better Kenny. Uh, which brings me, Colin, to your tweet has got a little bit of traction over the weekend. I, I think you initially tweeted that um, league clubs against non-league clubs in, in this year's cup scored forty one goals conceded. I, I think like this sort of sparked the debate about how big the gap is between, let's just say, even the first division and the top end of the amateur game, the intermediate game, a gap that I think you'd argue is is only getting wider and there's probably a few reasons for that. So what what, what would you say around that? Yeah, it's, look, I think after the first round as well, there was a lot of talk about the, the, the gap between the, the professional clubs and the non-league clubs. And um, yeah, the gap is widening and... and Look, we were talking with Graham last week and uh, uh, Graham Garton last week, and he was saying that, that that should be the case. It should be a case where like professional clubs should be beating the, these amateur clubs quite easily. I'd like to th- like I'm kind of a an oldie in the sense that I like to see an L Cup ups- upset now and then, but I just don't think it's possible with the way the seasons are aligned. Um, it's with the non league clubs. They're they're in pre season. They're coming to the end of pre season at the moment, and it's just very very difficult. There's lads. On holidays, I know Malahide United. They played Waterford the other day. They were missing their centre half. Um, and then it at that level when you when you're missing somebody as important as 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 a centre half, and you're bringing in somebody, it's it's a huge difference, especially when you're coming up against a side like Waterford. Um, but at the same time, it's it f- facts facts are facts. Um, and the, you said there, forty one goals conceded. But I think the big one is that not even one goal has been scored in those nine games. And you might say to yourself, "Well, well, have they been playing Premier Division clubs? Have they been playing top end Premier Division clubs?" The answer is no. They scored more. First Division clubs have scored more goals than Premier Division clubs playing a game less. So um, I just think that yeah, I, I think something needs to be done about it, Anthony. From being completely honest, because I do like to see I do like to see an upset now and then. I, I like I, I'd be one to say that I preferred the, the, the professional clubs to get as far as possible. I'd, I'd, I'd say to that, but now and then you'd like to see a cup upset because that's what the cup is all about. But at the moment, it's just completely and utterly miles off. Um, and Minute University Town, they put it up to Treaty in the first half, went in at, um, went in at the break nil all. And then, um, sorry, first 40 minutes or something, and then, and then the current put away a penalty. And then it's just fatigue in the second half. And then the fact that Treaty United have had a, num- a whole half a season ahead of them, they just brushed them aside in the second half. And that's just a disappointing thing. I think that's what that, that's what we see a lot of. Bonaghy United got to just stroke a half time against Shelburne at nil all and ended up losing 4-0. So it's just those type of um, results that I just think need to change. I don't know how what Gary feels about it, um, but that's just my take on it. But when you say something needs to be done, do you mean that, like, I mean, not just in terms of the uh, upset, do you mean in terms of facilitating the game? Because the intermediate level has a history of players stepping up uh, from, let's say, uh, there's a, there's many examples, but Richie Tell, for example, had a spell at Bluebell United. Uh, is that what you mean? Or is it just because you, you'd like to see the odd upset, you think it would be good for the competition? 
I think Richie's a bit different because he he came home from Scotland and just it was just a, a stepping stone before he was obviously going to go back in and, and play at play at League of, League of Ireland. Even look at Dundalk, uh, we mentioned Gary mentioned Wexford Dundalk earlier on and the, the Wexford score that scored the second goal. Jer Short came in from Collinstown recently and he was absolutely superb on Friday night. Put I put him in the team of the week last week. Um, he's lighting up the first division. So yeah, there is players that are able to t- make that step up. I'm more talking about perhaps playing the re- playing the first or second round, first round, maybe at the end of the amateur season, and then playing the second round at now. You know, um, just to give them a little a, a little more of a chance, or put the see make the seasons aligned, make the amateur league exactly the same as the league of Ireland. Now there's going to be. I doubt that's going to happen because I think there was a there was talk of this before, and only seven clubs had, had agreed to go with the uh, with the summer season. So look, at that. I don't think that's going to happen. But perhaps just give them a little bit of a chance and and play the games a little bit earlier in the season. Maybe I, I suppose, Gary. The other side of this is you could say, well, look, the League of Ireland clubs are just getting stronger. They're better prepared. They're fitter, and. You know, it's it's only right that the gap is getting bitter, bigger if we want the league to continue to go from strength to strength. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I think that should be the case. And look, on the evidence of the games over the course of this season, it, it is and it's bearing through. Like, you know, League of Ireland clubs and players are becoming more professional. The, even the younger players, are, like you, you have a case where you've got the best young players now staying in, in the country. So all these young players are in professional clubs, professional environments. Everyone is kind of, Everything has moved on, like, you know, sports nutrition, uh, strength and condition, all this sort of stuff. And then you've got clubs over the last 10 years who have, you know, co- uh, competed really well in Europe. Uh, and our teams, because of the season that's going to the season's going, the summer season has helped our team perform in Europe. And now you've got a case where you've got Shamrock Rovers, this will be their second time in group stages. The Dock have been twice in group stages. So the teams below are having to get better themselves because they see the competition, what they're doing. So... That's why the gap between intermediate and junior football is just going to widen because look, it, it's you know it's not the same. There are training hours, or uh, it's not the same. Well, facilities can be quite good actually in intermediate and junior football, to be fair. But uh, you know the, the amount of time on the pitch and the the, the strength condition and all that sort of stuff, it's just not going to be at the same level. So mm-hmm. our clubs are driving to try and get into group stages of uh, European competitions, and that's why the gap uh, is going to widen. And when you have the top clubs achieving that. The clubs behind that's their their drive is to get there, so it, it, it's obviously going to, you know, that gap is just going to get bigger. Yeah. Uh, elsewhere, then uh, UCD back on United three uh, two. Derry City got past Cork City two 0 and then yesterday, even the last game of the weekend, Shamrock Rovers uh, squeezed past Draw United two one. Thanks to Andy Lyons, Gary, and he's a man who's having a very impressive campaign. Uh, a good few days from he got the winner the other night as well, didn't he, against Ferenc Farris? But um, that was a big moment for him, and the double remains on for Rovers. Yeah, it was a it's a brilliant week for Andy. Obviously, to score that goal against Ferenc Farris, and then you know to get the to get the winner last night. And to be fair, that was a cracking game, a uh, really good. I know, and it would have been probably class as an upset where you've dropped a um, you know, really turning up playing excellent. So the Colin McCabe was brilliant. The goals, um. You know, uh, Cowan and Quinn were very good at the back. Gary Deegan was sensational in the middle of the park yesterday. He was absolutely brilliant and uh, brought to really put it up to Sean McGrovers. But Andy Lyons turns up uh, late on in, in uh, sorry, in extra time and, and terrific strike. Ball just bounces kindly in the box for him and absolutely buries it. But yeah, Sean McGrovers march on. But, you know, I have to say, Kevin Doherty has done a terrific job at Drada. And, you know, that team, when you think of the te- the players that they lost, they lost the whole, like their goalkeeper, David Otto, moves to. We lost Joe Redmond, uh, Brown, uh, Kane, Phillips, all these guys, Mark Doyle, all went out of the squad and, and has really had to put together a, basically a brand new team. Um, and he's done a terrific job and, and they were excellent yesterday, but just unfortunate that, you know, Sean McGrover's like, um, you know, like it was a really good assist by Farage, uh, the ball into the box um, for the goals. And the, Sean McGrover's, I, they don't really have a massive squad, but they've got great quality in it. You know, you look at the young lads coming through and making a real difference uh, over the games, and uh, especially the young lads getting game time in Europe. It's been it's been excellent for them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not the first time draw that caused Sean McGrover's problems uh, this season. Disappointing for them yesterday, but that they are safe, really. Realistically, they look safe, um, and indeed they have uh, had a, a solid campaign. Um, we will move on and look, Ben Conan, at Sean McGrover's 
Europa Conference League group. There's a good article on the 42.ie by Gavin Cooney a few days ago, just sort of breaking down the finances and, and having a look at the teams that they're going to be playing. So Shamrock Rovers have secured uh, about 2.9 million euro from UEFA just to get to the group stages. Wins are worth 500 grand. Draws are worth 166 grand. Uh, if they top the group, they get an extra 625 grand. And if they finish second, they get 325 uh, grand. So their group will be Ghent, uh, Molda and Jor Gardens. So, Colin, can they do it? Can Shamrock Rovers come second in this group? Is that a realistic target uh, and ambition for them to have? Doing by the European performances this season... Uh, Anthony, you could say yes because they're four from four at Tallah Stadium. It's they've beaten French Forest the other day. Um, Andy Lyons, we talked about a few minutes ago with a, a fantastic header with a couple of minutes to go. But you're coming up against three sides that, yeah, right. You're looking at Ghent and, and Malda who have fantastic European pedigree. Um, Malda sitting seven points clear at the top of the, the Norwegian league. Context: Bolo Glimt that beat Linfield eight nil. Uh, in second place, Viking that beat Sligo 4-0 are in, are in sixth place. So um, their striker, David Fofana, has 12, seven goals and 12 starts. So he's going to be somebody that you're going to have to keep an eye on. Um, the setting's beautiful. I think that the, the of the stadium, I think the fans are going to really enjoy heading to Malda. I think um, that'll be a that'll be a fantastic trip for the for the for the Shamrock Rovers fans. Ghent, they haven't started the season particularly well. Uh, they're struggling in the Belgian league. Um, five points from or eight points from five games. Um, Neil Lennon's and Moni Nicosia beat them in the last round in the Europa League playoff round, uh, 4-0 in aggregate. So that probably would have been a little bit of an upset, um, a surprise um, defeat for them. Um, played in the Conference League last year, got through the group stages, and Pauk beat them um, in the last round of 32. Obviously, we all know about Pauk considering Bowles run last year at the Viva Stadium. And then everyone's everyone's saying Jur Gardens that that that's the they're the fourth seeds obviously and they're all saying that that's probably going to be the one that that Shamrock Rovers can take points off but they comfortably got through three rounds of of Europe they won the right in over the course of the three games it was fifteen six on aggregate that they won their games and that's very very comfortable at that level they're they're six points off the lead with a game in hand um in the Swedish league ahead of um Mal they're, they're ahead of Malmo and AIK as well so. Look, these are a good side. They played Shamrock Rovers in Europe back in 2002, winning 5 1 in aggregate as well. So there's a little bit of history there between the two sides. But I just think that if they can keep the fortress at Tala going, um, I, there's a, a great chance for a, a win or two. Um, I just think with the quality, I don't think it was a good draw. I, I think there could have been an, an easier draw for them, if I'm being completely honest. And um, and if they manage to get third place, second place, it will be an absolutely fantastic achievement for Shamrock Rovers. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a funny one, isn't it, Gary? Because they, they avoided some of the bigger names, you know, West Ham, I think of Villarreal were, were in in there potentially. But as Colin says, they, they are good sides. But there's a psychology around this as well. Like Ghent, for example, and, and probably Mola, they will feel that they shouldn't be in the Europa Conference League. They should be in the Europa League. Um, yeah. Can, can Shamrock Rovers maybe use that? Because the thing for Shamrock Rovers, and, and you will have had experience for this, of this as well with Dundalk, like, I guess they're carrying the hopes of the, they're representing the league, like the, the chance to make history. If they actually got to the knockout stages of this competition, that is a big, big deal, isn't it? Absolutely. Look, I actually disagree. I think it's not a bad draw because like, I see Genk as probably one of the weaker teams in that top seed pot, if you like, because Molde arguably could, be, could have been you know, a, a top seed. They're probably. I think Molde would be more than likely to top the group. If I'm honest, I think they would be my favourites to top the group. And um, we, I played against them uh, at Dundalk, and they're a really, really good outfit. And you know, they've kicked on again, and and, and they're they're top in the league. I think what's going to be key for Shamrock Rovers is their first game because that sets you up. The first game is the best game they could have got in the group. If you look at the group as a whole, it's it's your guards at home, and if if they're going to get anything out of the group and I think they will pick up points in this group but to, to finish second it's going to be it, the foundation for that will be a home win in the first round uh, and that's you know in order to get out of the group or to be third or fourth or, sorry second or third you have to start with a home win 
I don't read too much into the home form in the group stages because some of the uh, some of the games that they went into, like say Ferran Varus, I don't think Ferran Varus played a yard the other day. The first half was, you know, pretty boring. Um, there was they, they weren't really pushing, but it was great for Shamrock Rovers to go and get the win late on in the game. So, but like this is going to be a totally different, uh, totally different game uh, when it comes to group stages and to have your regards in the first game, and they'll see that as an opportunity to get off to a win the start as well because it's so important that sets you up. Um, but I think um, if they're going to get out of the group, the home form is going to be key. Um, and the, the first and the last game, is that if, they, if they're in with a shout from the last game away from home against your guys, well, they'll be very happy with uh, with how they've performed in, in the group stages. It, is it a significant thing, Gary, that they get to stay in Tala? Like they're going to stay in their home ground. I know when you were playing, you just had to move away from Oriel Park. Like is, is, that, is that a big thing for them? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's really good for you know growing the Shamrock Rovers brand. Um, obviously, look, they're based in Tala. They've got a really good following, um, but it, it's really good that you know the people that support them can you know walk to their games. Like for it's for the local community that they have there. I guess probably one thing that the Dundalk missed out on, like we would have had to go to Tala and we went obviously to the Viva Stadium, stuff like that. Like there's a great buzz around say Dundalk when you've got a European game and you've got teams coming to. Oriel Park to play in Europe. When you lose that a little bit, you know, for the for the supporters, for the players, I suppose it doesn't really make much difference. You're playing the European game, but for the for the whole uh, ex- European experience for the fans and that, it's great that it's going to be in Tala for them. And uh, look, it will be packed. All three games will be packed for them. And um, like I said, if they can start off with a home win, well, that will really kickstart them and give them an opportunity to to progress and and to possibly get out of the group because. I think it will be quite a tight group with 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 all the teams taking points. So I I would favour Molde as probably the the best team, maybe to top the group. But then we we'll wait and see how that goes. I just think that that the 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 away form against the the superior sides is really really poor. Like they have three 0 against Ludogorets and four 0 against Ferenc Varos. Like and I know those teams are perhaps going to be better than the likes of Ghent or Jurgardens. I think Molde will be pretty similar. Um, so it's just a matter of their away form being a little being a little bit more compact and and their defence being a bit, a bit more compact and uh, away from home and they, they might get a chance. They might have and a chance. You, and you're right, Colin, and you look at them two away performances, they were away in heat. So I think even the, the you know the geography of this group that is more northern uh, and the temperatures won't be as bad, I think that gives them a, a better chance as well. Like if you're going to go and play in Greece, I think they struggled against Ferran Varus and the heat over there. Uh, whereas I think the the climate for these games it's only a small thing, but I think that will that will make a bit of a difference as well. It gives them a better better opportunity too. Yeah, and uh, after that first home game against Joe Gardens, they have back to back away matches against Ghent and then Molde. So you have to think that really. I mean, that's that's a tough double header for them. So that first home match on Thursday, the eighth of September. Uh, that is a big night for Shamrock Rovers, and we look forward to that. We're also looking forward to a massive game for the Republic of Ireland women's team. They play Finland on Thursday night. Conan, a win, and they are into the playoffs for the World Cup. Um, I think sometimes when we're talking about the women's game, there are similarities with the League of Ireland in terms of the need for exposure, positive exposure, growing the fan base, growing the audience. Um how significant a night is it then for this team? Because this is a chance for them, isn't it? This really is a chance. They got two games remaining in the group, Finland at home, then they travel to Slovakia. Um, they can wrap it up on Thursday night with a win against Finland, who are kind of coming under a, a bit of a cloud. They've sacked their manager, they had a disappointing Euros. And Tala is a sellout. It's long been a sellout. It's all out within half an hour, the tickets go on general sale. So there is a buzz, there is momentum, and there's a big chance. It's been a buzz for a while. Um, Anthony over, over this team um, and it's been absolutely incredible to watch I have two daughters myself Vera Pau actually came down to, to my local club Sword Celtic at the weekend on Saturday um, and an absolute breath of fresh air um, she spent a couple of hours chat, chatting to the kids um, and it's just it was just brilliant just to see her the interaction between between the girls and, and Vera and um, yeah, you mentioned there that, that they, they didn't have a great Euros, but they got to the Euros and Ireland didn't. Um, they sacked their coach, he said, but we all know that there's a bounce back when, it, when, that, when that happens and it could fire up that, that Finnish squad to, to, to perform at Tala. And like, yeah, we beat them in Helsinki as well. The keeper had an absolute nightmare that, that evening. Um, so they'd be definitely gunning for, 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 for Ireland now. But I think the big, big thing is the Tala crowd. 
like there was talk that the game should be played at the Viva Stadium, and but the players decided, the management decided they needed a talent, and two thousand kids will be there through the FAI club schools um, initiative, um, and it's just going to be an, an absolutely fantastic occasion, and um, it's great to see, as you said, that the, that the tickets were sold out in thirty minutes, and highest ever position that we've that that Ireland has been in the rankings. They're in the top sixteen in in, in Europe. Um, things are going so well for them, and, and even on the pitch as well. They've some of the the international players have got fantastic summer moves. Like said, Chloe Mustaki has gone to Bristol City. Um, Kira Grant has moved as well. Jessica Zhu has gone to West Ham. Um, Saoirse Noonan has moved to Durham. So they're the. It's like we're on the the. The actual women's team are on the up. But the actual players within the squad as well are making significant progress in their own careers. And it, it, it's the team selection that I think is Vera Pau is going to have the biggest headache. Um, will obviously with um, Carusa out injured, who, who's going to start up front? Will it be Heather Payne? Um, Amber Barrett has got a fantastic move as well. Leanne Kiernan now is playing in, in, in top, top tier with Liverpool. Will she get the start? Um, so I think it's there's a couple of headaches. Lily Ag, will she play instead of Arisha Little John in midfield? I don't think so because I think Little John has been absolutely superb in the middle of the park. So there's these little um, tactical bits of inf- detail that that Vera Pell will need to sort out in the coming days, and and no better, Colleen. Yeah, just, just on the stadium, Gary. There's, there's loads made of this of moving the team to uh, the Aviva, but like I think the players some would say themselves like they'd rather be playing in front of six and a half thousand in Tala than let's say eight or ten thousand in the Aviva. Well, you know, the atmosphere will get lost. And there is a really sort of unique atmosphere around these matches as well. They're very family friendly, a lot of a lot of kids at it. Nice buzz. So they, they, they understandably don't want to lose that at this point in time. Yeah, look, they're absolutely right to play it in talent. Look, it, they've said it themselves, it's their home and they're feeling this that and it, which is brilliant. Like they really are on the cusp of something great here, but you know that in itself brings, I suppose, a little bit of pressure because you know the Finland game. You know, although they won it, it was a tight game away over there. Um, but now they're, you know, it's, it's there. It's within touching distance, and, and it's time for this squad to kind of take it on and put themselves, you know, in position to get into the playoffs. So you've got fantastic senior players in that squad, like you've Denise Sullivan, Katie McCabe, Onyo Gomer, with over over a hundred caps. All these players are have been driving it, and then you've got young. Young players like Jess Sue, Abby Lark, and Ellen Malloy coming behind. So like they're gonna they're gonna take on the mantle from from those senior players over the next few years. But wouldn't it be great that if they could kick on and get into into uh, into competition for the first time? Uh, and I think you know they're they're nearly there. I think Torres is going to be a terrific occasion for them, and it's a real stage for for women's football in Ireland. And I really hope that they can obviously look they've great talent in the squad, but it, you know. There is a little bit of different pressure that they're going to feel in this on this occasion, and it'd be great for them to get across the line and get themselves into the playoffs because you know off the back of the, the European Championships, everyone can see it. All the players are going over to if they're not involved, but they're going to watch this, watch them on the TV. They go over, they go over to the games and see them live. So it's within it's within their grasp now to to get themselves involved in, in that sort of competition. So it's a very exciting time for for football in in this country. And like like Tony says, a lot of the girls have made really good moves. Um, you know, like the Chloe, who's gone over to Bristol City, like they're they're really kicking on, and football is going from strength to strength, and, and that's only going to improve. Yeah, it's a, a big night indeed. That match is live on RT two on the RTE player on Thursday night. Just a quick roundup then of the women's national league games at the weekend. Uh, Wexford kept up the pressure on Shelburne at the top of the table. They bet Bohemians five two at Daly Mount Park, and the Malloy, Kylie Murphy, Nicholas Sinnott, May Russell, and Anya Walsh got the goals there. Shelburne are still two points clear, though. They got Galway 2-1, thanks to goals from Jesse Stapleton and Noel Murray. Uh, at Long Town are having a great season. They're still third. They bet Sligo 4-2. P-Mount are fourth. They bet Treaty United 6-0. And DLR Waves edge past Cork City 1-0. Mia Dodd got the all-important goal there. Now, there were two 9-0 hammerings over the weekend. Celtic battered uh, Dundee United on, yesterday on Sunday and on Saturday, Liverpool hammered Bournemouth 9-0. And unfortunately, uh, it was a long, tough day at the office for our Irish goalkeeper, Mark Travers. Gary, I mean, I don't know if you've ever conceded nine goals, but uh, that, that, that's a nightmare for a keeper, isn't it? It's a lonely place to be when you're not getting much protection in front of you. I don't know why you're coming to me on this one, Anthony. It's a bit unfair, to be honest. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah, look, it's a really tough one. Uh, thankfully, I don't remember conceding nine. Definitely conceded seven, um, but not nine. Yeah, look, it's a really tough day. And to be fair, like I think the first six goals, I don't think you could question them at all. I think it was the seven goal where he parried it out and he was finished off. But look, it, it's a it's a really tough day at the office, and, and it's a, it's a difficult one. I think you know you just when you've conceded that many goals so early in the game, you just want that game to be over and. Uh, it would have been a painful experience. I don't think he comes out with, with his reputation damaged or anything like that. Like it's just not a nice experience to see that amount of goals in the game, and um, for anybody. But um, yeah, like I said, it wasn't a case that he he made a mistake for the first, second, or third or anything like that. You know, it's a marginal kind of error, maybe on on, on the seventh goal. But yeah, it's a it's a really tough one for him. Yeah, I mean, he didn't have much protection in front of him, Colin. To be fair, either. No, he didn't. But I I think. The fallback on this now is that Scott Parker is going to have to make changes. Um, because if he doesn't, then his own probably his job is going to be at stake. So it's probably going to be Nito that uh, that, that comes in to replace him. Um, and that's just the disappointing aspect of it. Like if he does play again, it, it shows a great faith in him, confidence in him. But because of the of the 9-0, it's gonna he's gonna have to do something. Um defense in front of him were really poor, they were so deep. Um for a large portion for the, for the crosses into the box um like and it's just too easy for for a team like Liverpool to, to put balls into the box because that's we, we know that's what they do mm. um but like this is this isn't an uncommon scoreline now in, the, in in Premier League era it's three of the last four seasons there's been a 9-0 hammering Southampton and have been on the end of two of them um and with Celtics one up north as well winning winning 9-0 against Dundee United like we've got to remember, only a couple of weeks ago, AZ Alkmaar hammered Dundee United seven 0 in the in the Europa League, I think. So it's it just goes to show that the the that Dundee United aren't, and unfortunately, that's where Jamie McGrath is, aren't the the, the force that they were over the last number of seasons. Mm. Um, they equal the record um of an SPL victory Celtic to beat Aberdeen twelve years ago nine 0 as well. So look, these don't in 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 Scottish football, these don't happen all too frequently either considering the dominance that Celtic and Rangers have so it's just one of these things that that, that unfortunately um happens and with Irish players on both teams it doesn't uh, it doesn't look great yeah just, just one last quick one to, to finish up lads I just want to ask about Evan Ferguson because he scored in the Carabao Cup for Brighton uh last week um Graham Potter said this is something he said a few times we have to remind ourselves he's still only 17. I think we all have to remind ourselves that, Gary, because he's been around already. It feels like he's been around for a long time. Well, I guess he has, really, because he made his, his debut with Bohemians when he was 14. He's one of these players that physically looks ready for it. You know, he's, he's almost a man already. Um, does he need a loan move, Gary, or do you think if he just sits tight, his chance is going to come there? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I would have played against Evan and his father, so that really tells you it's time for me to retire. Um, but what, what a player he is. I, I actually watched him a couple of weeks ago. He played against Crystal Palace 21s in Selhurst Park and he scored in that game as well. Uh, it's a real conundrum at the minute for Brighton as to what the best route is for him. I actually think he he, he kind of, because he's probably not getting enough football to challenge him. Like 21s football is fine, but he needs to be challenged at a higher level. We can see that he's capable of it. He's a very, very exciting uh, young talent. Like, but more interesting, he's he's a really good lad off the pitch as well as everything else. So like he's got a massive future ahead of him. I do think that a lone move is what he needs to do, championship level possibly. It's about just getting the you know that lone move right because you know you've got to you've got to be getting the right game time as well. Whereas Brighton won't be able to control that necessarily when they when they, when he goes on loan. So, but uh, it, it's very exciting to see him, him and his progress and. You know, when he's burst onto the scene, like a, as a fourteen-year-old playing against Chelsea in a in, in a friendly in Daly Mount Park, and you know his progression from there, like he looks just so he's so mature as a young man anyway. But like you, you look at him physically on the pitch, you've got no issues with him. But the the next challenge for him is to be getting more regular football because he's kind of fallen between two stools in terms of probably not getting enough of minutes with the first team. And then, you know, 21's football probably not being a, a big enough challenge for him. But what a prospect we have in our hands. I think um, football in this country, it looks really, really bright with the young players that are coming through, the likes of Smallbone, the 21's that uh, that Jim Crawford has at his, has his disposal at the minute. And there's, 
you know, there's players coming out of the Warwick nearly every week, and um, you know, new players that we maybe haven't heard of turning up playing with championship teams and stuff like that. So it's it's very exciting, but it, it, certainly Evan Ferguson is leading the way in that. Yeah, well, we don't want to put too much pressure on him, Conan. He's so young, but I mean, if he is, where where would you rank him in terms of a prospect in recent years? Because we've seen like Troy Parrott, for example, had a lot of hype about him at that sort of age. Uh, Aaron Connolly, like it is. It's not easy to break into a Premier League club, but the signs are good. Yes, and I'd, I'd be one of those those people. You're probably asking the wrong person now to hype somebody up because I'd go the complete opposite way, considering what is what we've seen with Aaron Connolly and and Troy to a certain extent as well. Um, and if you're, <laughs> I think if his father's listening to this, Barry, I think he'd be he'd be uh, he won't be best pleased that we're even talking about him. Mm. Um, but yeah, look, he's he's got so much potential and obviously Graham Potter has trusts him that, that he's using him sparingly in the, in, in the Premier League at such a young age um, he's got a very very bright future ahead of him along with his, his, his fellow teammates James uh, Andrew Moran and James Furlong as well Like they're, these are players that uh, I think Andrew Moran has a very very good chance of progressing um, very very creative player um, but we also like I, I was just thinking the, there last night the, the players that we haven't really put too much pressure on and ultimately doing very very well and like Nathan Collins like there wasn't really much talk of him over the last number of when he was get, stepping up through the through the ranks and like when he was with Stoke and Burnley and and, and, and the like and then he had a wonderful summer there for, for Ireland and um we, we see what he's doing now with Wolves so like I, I'd be one to say yes he, by all, he's got unbelievable potential um his ability is there for, for everyone to see. You, you, you were saying there about him being his stature and his, his, his strength, and maybe perhaps he, he grew more than people his age, and that might have risen his stock a little bit because he was able to compete when other people his age weren't. But I don't think that's the case. I think that his ability on the ball as well is fantastic. Strength obviously helps. Um, game intelligence is really, really good for someone so, so young. And he can finish. Um, so, yeah, the, the future's bright for him. But as I said, I, I wouldn't put too much pressure on the kid. OK, well, we'll leave it there for this week. Thanks to Conan and Gary for joining us. Uh, just a reminder again that Republic of Ireland Finland game is live on RT2 on the RT player. And there's live commentary on an extended Game On programme on 2FM. Uh, Adrian Eames on commentary there with Alan Colley. So make sure you tune into that. And we'll have a live blog also on the RTE Sport website. Thanks again to the lads for joining me and we will be back next week. Good luck.